happy to have uh, Simone Karun Flett from McGill University talking to us about gravitational estimates from CF dispersion locations. Thanks. So, it's a pleasure to be uh, with you here. First time in the so, so, yeah, you may not guess what I'm using from the title. It's going to be a talk about uh, EDS-CHT and, and basically trying to develop CFT techniques to understand uh, uh, gravity. So just as a, let me start, like a very general slide to ask uh, uh, what are the more, sort of most general questions to try to ask here is the, so, so I guess one of the main questions, so many field theories that are strongly coupled turn out to be described as theories of gravity in individual in ADS space. So that's the uh, content of the gauge gravity correspondence. And, and many years into this, this correspondence, we'd like to understand better What's the basic mechanism? How does it work? So I give you CHT with some properties. How do you see that this is gravity? And we very eventually would like to use, really learn how to use the CHT to answer gravity problems. So for example, what geometry is, what kind of gravity theories are consistent, and that can be mentioned. How do we see these things on the CHT? Eventually, uh, how, like, how does it work at black order operation in the theory? On a more sort of practical, the other one would also like to apply a ADS CFT to theories that are not exactly in ADS space. You'd like to understand the specific theories of the other theory, which may be sometimes close to the graphic theory, but not quite close. Can we have QFT techniques that we can use to address these theorems? And, and, the, and so if we can understand better how ADS CFT works from the CFT perspective, then maybe we can move a bit away and do this sort of thing. So that's sort of the general go over why it's interesting to understand the CFT from the CFT, uh, CFT viewpoint. So, so more specifically, uh, uh, sort of context of this talk is uh, within this, uh, this conjecture that was made. So one can ask what, what are the CFTs which are supposed to have an um, ADS dual? And this gentleman, a couple of years ago, uh, observed that all of the examples that we had Add certain features, and they, they, they abstracted that and they all, all of the uh, any theory with the local the local dual in ADS should have these properties. So if you have a theory, it's conformative theory with some kind of large n extension and a spectrum of operators that's not some sparse, which means that there are very few operators, you know, very few single trace operator up to a certain gap. Then, conjecture that vice versa, any theory with these properties will have the bulk theory that is described by gravity. One of these being like a local view of gravity down to a scale, down to some next scale that's set by this gap. So, it was very, very uh, stimulating conjecture. And one thing that they show, for example, is that if you classify the solution to crossing symmetry, such theories, you find that they're exactly the same as the contact interactions. So basically, the Lagrangians you could write down in ADS. So that, that gave some some evidence for the duality. But it was, you, yeah. Uh, yeah. you have to have just any Don't distinguish between matrix like or vector like large no. and no, just okay. mean large number of mm -hmm. So the, the sort of the hard this, the part which remains mysterious for, for a long time about this uh, this conjecture was the part about locality. So it's nice to be able to, to classify local uh, uh, 
a grand gems that you could write and Oracle DDS in terms of CSD. But the main thing is that if you have a local theory, this coefficient, some of the higher derivative interaction should have smaller coefficients. So the theory should be basically dominated by the two derivatives, the grand gem, up to small corrections. And one way to say this is that the, all the corrections should come out from integrating out heavy particles, like string states. And if you integrate out a string scale, you get higher derivative corrections, which expressed by S here at some energy scale in the process with like more derivatives and all of these terms to express by by part of this max. And in string theory, for example, this assignment scale would be the string scale. Where all the we have the first states that you if the energy S is high enough, they are comparable then. One yeah. of them square will be comparable to any higher order. Yeah so this what do you do then? Yeah so this and this integrating out only makes sense at low energy. Yeah. High energies you have to use the full string theory. I see. So that S must yeah. be much smaller than N square. Yeah, but S, yeah, exactly. But yeah, mm -hmm. when you look at the, uh, there, are, there are many, uh, uh, unless you really make an effort to focus the physics into the bulk, there are many uh, typical correlation functions that are dominated by energy scales or the ADS scale. And, and you're not worried about summing it up, even if S is small compared to N square. No, if, it's, if S is small, this would be small correction. But if I add them up, uh, and the series diverges, uh, it's it actually has some, it actually converge. Uh, hmm. I see. Well, this, but this special case it's m squared, but I think it's quite generic. It's the, uh, it's the first, is the mass of the first, uh, the first thing you mentioned it about. What about the shape of the spectrum? Yeah. 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 So, so you get an effective theory where you, so m square would be basically zero for the stress tensor, and that you keep. So that, but the point is that to get the theory, we just have to, so the stress tensor gives you graviton in the body. But to get the theory, we just have the graviton, you first have to integrate out the string scale, the string holes. And I'm, I'm talking about this, this integrating out this. So you have some exchanges like with graviton, yeah. you don't call them local, otherwise those, are the, those things you call No, local. no, but it's still describing a local theory of It's local in the sense that we have a bulk theory that's probably a local Lagrangian for a gravity theory with only one field, the graviton, or just finite number of fields. So you still have a basically local theory in the bulk. Whereas if you have a, a string theory in the bulk, or if you have infinitely fields in the bulk, then it's not a local theory. Here you have a bosonic picture where you're yeah. only concerned with spin two and higher. Yeah. You're not interested in skin zero or oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. one. Zero, one, two are there. Not, but not uh, the precise statement of this gap is that the first thing with spin higher than two is far away. I see. It's very easy. Okay. But zero, one, two, three out, one out, they all come from all okay. line. So, so the big question is, what's the CFT formula which allows you to integrate out a, a particle in the ADS? That, that's the basic thing we're looking for. What's the CFT formula which tells you you can integrate out a particle and, 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 and the correction? So, so you know, Roshinsky and all, when they made this conjecture a few years ago, they looked at all the textbook and tried some creative things and you, know, you, look, you, you look up the, the CFT textbook and, and, and you don't find this one. That's obvious from the CFT perspective why, uh, uh, why you can do that. Which is something that's very obvious in the book, but it's not obvious in the CFT side. So the main message of what I'm going to tell you today is that if you combine two books, you can <laughs> find the <a> formula. <laughs> So here's the, the general plan. So, so to really understand uh, uh, this, we'll have to look at, uh, uh, so to understand CFTs, we get all the constraints from looking at the four-point functions. And here, we, it will really be important to look at the Lorentzian, not just the Euclidean and four points. That's where we really get our constraints. So what we derive by combining these two books is basically some CFT version of the dispersion relation. So I will explain the beginning, so it's going to be a somewhat technical talk, but the beginning I'll try to explain really what the idea, why is it important, to have, uh, why does it solve the problem, to have a system relation. 
I'm going to tell you how how uh, we should derive so that uh, spring, how things this formula. Then I'll describe some application that I've been pursuing with, uh, the, with some other people. Um, and, and so discuss how we get some like concrete application of this in the case of uh, the ESI process. So the start. So so how do we? So what's a four point correlator in the uh, in, in, in CHT? So. So the component field theory is okay. The two-point functions are always kind of trivial because you have two two vectors at the uh, phi x one, phi x two. The corridor will go like x one minus x two to some some power, so like distance. So the two-point function in, in CFT is just fixed up to one one exponent, up to the dimension of the operator. The three-point functions are similarly fixed fixed by kinematics, but the four-point function is, is is a rich object, which is really a function of actually two variables. And one way to see the two variables is you can use all the, the symmetries to fix the position of, say, one guy at one, one guy at minus one, and then we can. So if this is, if you think of this in the, if this were to be in space, this would be kind of explained. So we put one operator at, say, row, and the other minus row. And it's, very, it's going to be convenient to choose these kind of symmetry of coordinates. And here you should think of these two coordinates as like home coordinates. So, so this wedge here are like window wedges. Is this a light cone you have drawn? Yes, so these are light wedges. And uh, one, two, three, four are in space like region. Yes, yes. Okay. yes. So I have two, yeah. So they have two mm -hmm. space like regions. And, and the whole kinematics is characterized by this variable rho and rho. And your fields are uh, they don't have to be free fields. Uh, no, that's the whole point. Uh, there are there are some composite operators and some complicated theory. This phi, I'm referring to this phi. Yeah, there's there really some mm -hmm. more complicated components. I see, yeah, I see. Which okay. can have arbitrary non Okay, okay. So the basic the way we wanna try to analyze this uh, 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 this four point function in CFTs is you beat it down to Three point function and smart and, and, and the center objects. And the idea is if you take the limit where, uh, say, rho goes to zero, so this limit, the point three and four will collide, and you can do a series expansion around that limit. And the, the OP, the operator product expansion, is just a, it's just a series expansion. So in the limit that two operators collide, you replace them by a new operator. And then your, your diagram becomes proportional to some, some coefficient yeah. and some power loss. And eventually later in the stock, these this powers will become so-called constant blocks. And somehow there's some derivatives and some, some terms, but conceptually it's just a series expansion. That's it. So as I mentioned, we'll stay between these render wedges. So if we were to put all the, the four points like space-like from each other, it would really be We'll be doing nothing that's not just the trivia. So, so we're gonna get something interesting if we cross some light cone. And the light cone we can cross, staying in this case, is basically we can take four to be in the future of one. So bring this past this light cone, this distance becomes time light. And at the same time, I'm using this reflection uh, symmetrical coordinate, so this also becomes time light. So two and three always remain space-like from one and four. This is the most general thing I can do in that setup. And most of the physics we're going to get will come from analyzing specifically the region limit. And that, that's a limit which corresponds to having applying a large boost to the operator of four. So it approaches a light cone, but it's sent far up, and three also sends far up. So I apply this, I do the most extreme Lorentz thing I can do. What happens in this limit? So the physics is going to localize in time, just because I'm applying all these large boots, so you know, get all these learned con contracted pancakes. So you're scattering pancake against a pancake. So the physics will localize very well in time, actually in two time directions, but two null directions. But since boots don't affect the transverse plane, the whole physics will still be spread out transversely over basically 
distance, for example, the ATS radius. So, so we're going to, by analyzing this virginity, we can probe locality in these two time horizons, but not necessarily in the quantum plane. So we just contrast this to many pictures that people draw when they try to understand the uh, uh, Borg locality. The sharpest statements come from asking that if you, if you really try to beam particles into a point in EPS, you're supposed to be able to resolve a distance up to, say, the string scale. But uh, to beam such points into EPS, you will need these two points in the past to be time-like from two points in the future. That's something we cannot really do from, from this render wedge. For technical reasons, I, I don't want to leave the render wedge, so I can so the best we can do today to probe locality is a picture on the left. We were localized in time, but not in space. But maybe surprising that we can get some powerful constraint from doing that. So, but, but keep in mind that we're looking at Lorentz and Barnard theory. So if you can show locality in time, then you still have at least some imprints of full locality. So that, that's the idea. We're really be using constraints. So the logic, mathematically, although we phrased this, these constraints, so in the old days, like the 50s and 60s, people had a way of phrasing locality in time. In terms of when you free transform, it gives you an empty state energy. And, and that is the ingredient to our dispersion domain. For example, Kramers and Kronig in optics, they showed that you can reconstruct the dispersion relation of a photon from its absorptive, from the, uh, the absorption rate of the photon. And you have something similar for uh, uh, scattering amp suit. In that space, you can reconstruct an amp suit from its imaginary part, which I also call the absorptive part. So the main thing of this talk is that in CFT, we can do the same thing. We can reconstruct the four-point correlation function from some absorptive part. Yeah. Um, don't these asymmetric results fall, come, come out most easily in theories where you have a gap? I mean, isn't it extremely hard when you have massless particles? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So you might worry that uh, why you get anything in CFTs. So, so here then, this dispersion, this, 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 this CFT formula will be an analog of a dispersion relation in and because ADS is like a box, that's what provides the gap. Right? Okay. So it really works as in the gap case. Cool. Yeah. So that, that's a very good question. <laughs> I was puzzled for a while, but it, it really works just as well as in the gap case. To go from the top left locality in time to analytics, you do free and transform. Yes. What do you do to go to dispersion relation? So, but the, the, this formula is usually derived, uh, yeah, that, that, that's actually a question of the development. So, so to write this formula, what, what, what people write is you, if you write the complex plane, you say, okay, the absolute will have some branch cut in places. Mm -hmm. And then you, you look at the amplitude divided by, say, t minus uh, the m of t prime, t prime minus t prime of t, so you add a pole somewhere. And then you just declare that uh, m of t is a contour that you have on that mm -hmm. pole. And then you deform the contour to say that it's equal to this, mm -hmm. plus this arc, plus this arc. Mm -hmm. And then, as the crucial step, you drop the arcs. Mm -hmm. And the fact that statement that you drop the arc comes from saying, being able to say something at, about the limit m t of t. And, and that is the, uh, uh, so these, these arcs, these arcs come from the rigid. So if you have control over the rigid limit, mm -hmm. you can derive the dispersion relation. Okay. Uh, what about the model amplitude if you don't have any branch cuts in front because it's trying to make yeah, it? But you don't have imaginary part. Right? Well, a pole is the imaginary part. Because the, uh, the imaginary part of uh, you know, 1 over s the phi epsilon is like uh, phi delta s. If 
you don't have folders, then that's a contact attraction. We'll come to that later. That we cannot reconstruct on that. But the only thing you cannot reconstruct are contact interactions. So the goal is to get some, some formula that looks like that. What I would like to explain is what is this absorptive part in the CFT 4.1 function? That, that's the non obvious link here. What will create the role of the imaginary part of the amplitude? So the intuition is the following. So we're going to look at these four points as, so there's no S matrix in the CFT. But we can still look at things which look like, will look like elements of, of, of will be S matrix, which is basically look at this picture, especially when three and four approach a light cone. If this operator will want to uh, exonic station and want to propagate from two to four, and something else from one to two, and you're really scattering those two things around against each other. So this correlation function, so this, uh, this this correlator really looks like some S matrix element. But importantly, we're, no, we always write the S matrix element as the uh, as a connected part and the disconnected part, um, and and we focus on M interesting part, the connected part. But the corridor here as the full contains the disconnected part as well. But yeah, and then if you want to compute the, the major part of the answer, then we need something that's like a complex conjugate, that would be the, the central point corridor, but instead of time order, you can use the different one, so the anti-time order one, you can define this other guy. And but you see that with just these two guys, you cannot get the imaginary part of the amplitude. We need to subtract this, this connected part, so we need the third guy. And that third guy turned out to be something with some weird other order ordering, so called time order. But that's basically the same as the Euclidean correlator. So we define it more, more precisely. But the, 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 if you look at these three equations. So I'm confused. If yeah. From the first two, you can get n, right? I and mean, you can subtract. Well, you, you need, need, you need the thirds to get m. So to get the imaginary part of m, I need to add this equation. You subtract. I subtract. subtract. Uh, you just, if you subtract them, you just get the real part of them. I oh. the imaginary part. Oh, of I see. Okay, sorry. <laughs> to get okay. the imaginary part of m, I need to subtract that. Okay. <laughs> so you need these three terms, mm -hmm. and so you get this combination on the bottom line. So one way minus uh, g. So that would be the time order minus n. And this I would call a double discontinuity, this, this paper, and this, this talk. So it's double discontinuity because it, it, it's really like, so UKM minus one continuation with discontinuity, and then you subtract the other one. And you can also write it as a double commutator. So that, that's going to be the object which really, according to this analogy, gives the imaginary part. This double commutator has a many properties that that not so obvious, but not so hard to verify either. So it's easy to prove that it's positive. That's basically the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. We can show it's bounded also. It basically it's smaller than the uh, so it's, it's smaller than the Euclidean correlator against by again by, by Cauchy-Schwarz. Uh, it has some analytic properties, a complex plane, which I will not not discuss so much, but essentially uh, you can still do something like crossing, like going to the upper half plane. So it has properties that are very much like an amplitude. And these properties were very important in several work, including uh, so-called bound of chaos and, and a recent proof of the uh, average non condition. conditions. I'm not going to go through today so much, but essentially this work was motivated by trying to, to to get more physics out of this. Uh, this double Just system. your notation. This G means discontinuity in G. Yeah. What's the little d referring to? Double. Sorry? Double. Double, double discontinuity. Yeah. It's a double one because there's like mm -hmm. uh, two terms like that. Oh, okay. So if you have a log, it would give you zero. But if you have a log square, you get one. Okay. So it cheese on log square. I'd like to explain is uh, so why is it that it's separated by single traces? That's going to be a very desirable property in, uh, in 
partial series. So this is easy to see in the Uki. So, so if you try to take the Uki between three and four, okay, it, 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 there is a convergence. Uh, Series around zero will diverge when you cross a light cone, because that's one. You cannot use that OP there. But if you use the OP in the between one and four, nothing goes wrong when you go time like in that. So this OP between one and four actually converge everywhere in the distance diverge. If you use the correct the correct variable, this is the two variables I mentioned, it actually converge everywhere. But what you can see is that uh, if you look at one term in the OP, one and four, and you always get the distance x1 and four square times an exponent, which depends on the dimension delta of the operator you're exchanging. So one, two, you count the uh, operator with dimension delta, you get this exponent. And the point is that if you're exchanging double trace operators, let's go back. The point is that when you go time-like, the only thing that happens when you go time-like is that this distance becomes negative. So, so this thing picks up a phase. And, and the discontinuity is basically, uh, or the commutator is basically the difference between going taking the phase one way or the other way. So it's a sign. So this commutator is proportional to a sign of, of that exponent. But the point is you have double choice of parameters. So if you track the operator O1 and O2, you can make double traces by putting a bunch of that square between them. But all these operators have dimension that differ by adding integers. So this, this guy of dimension, so this, uh, this this extra dimension, this under dimension is, is an integer, plus some small under dimension is proportional to one per n. So, so this sign is basically one. So this computer is very small. It's pressed by one gram. And then you get a similar suppression from the other side. Because it's a double computer, you get this suppression twice. And that's, a, that's enough to give you uh, one gram four, which is the order of a one loop correction in, uh, in one gram convention. So, so the double discontinuity doesn't care how long about Double traces until you get like one root and one of them. So the dealing, dealing connected part comes only from exchanging single, single traces. If you put a single trace operator, then the sign will not be small and not be big. So, a pictorial way to say this is that this double discontinuity is, if you draw a written diagram in the S, we're just picking up on the cut, uh, just basically cutting the propagator in the ADS. Exactly like you would like a uh, unitary to work with uh, yes, you just want to cut the, the axial propagator. But it's not going to cut the... So with that information, we can basically make a sketch what we expect. What does the double discontinuity look like in this class of, of theories that I mentioned in the beginning that are conjecture to be developed to a graphic, double gravity. If you have a large M CFT with a sparse spectrum, so because it's large M, you basically just have to include the, uh, uh, the, the, the single trace operators up to, uh, so that one over N square is the first connected order. So you can compute this horizontal part of the graph from, from just the light single trace operators. And, and now imagine what happens when you have a heavy over. Plug the heavy operator in the OP extension around, so we have to use the extension around 1, 4 here, which is uh, around 1 in this picture. If you plug 1 minus something to a large exponent, it's basically something that's exponentially small. So the heavy operators can only appear if you squeeze that part of the plot. So the heavy operators only contribute to, the, uh, to this part of the plot. So by the canonical contribute to a region whose size is controlled by, by, the, by this guy. So is this diagram supposed to tell us what's the field content in the bulk? Uh, yeah, so the, so the, the, yeah, yeah, so different field contents would give you, different field contents in the massless states would give you different shape of that part of the curve. This correspond to massless state. 
the vastness. Yeah. But we're bar bargaining for gravity, though. I thought. Uh, yeah, the gravity. Yeah, the graviton is a massless. Well, yeah, but what else state. could be massless states in the bulk other than graviton? Or you could have some scale. I see. So slower spin fields we talked yeah, about all, earlier. Yeah, all this would be exactly. But nothing beyond spin two. No. Yeah. So if you have large gap by assumption, mm -hmm. everything above spin two will be heavy, so it continues only to the left of my And those are some mysterious states in you know you briefly mentioned that launch time. Yeah, I'm not going to assume much about these states. And the whole point is that so these these heavy states, they only contribute to that part of the plot. And the point is what we know is that this because this double discontinuity is, is bounded. The point is that there's only so much area you can squeeze in there. Meaning what? Meaning there are uh, finitely many distinct states? No, 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 or no, no. There, there, there's infinite, there's, there's, in general, there's, there has to be infinitely many of them. So squeezing means what then? But it, it cannot, because each of them is suppressed by this exponent. They will not be visible until you reach very close to here. But the height of this plot. Is, uh, uh, is, uh, is bounded by one. So, and the dispersion relation at the end of the day is going to ask you to compute some area under this curve. So, just by virtue of the fact that there's only so much area you can squeeze there, you're going to get some, some constraints. But we'll come to that later. But, yeah. Do you expect this under time by OB? Yeah. So, would there also be um, higher spin primaries available in the OB? Yes, all, all the single trace uh, primaries are there. All the single trace primaries, single trace, double trace, they're all there. Yeah. The so double trace primaries are suppressed by this sign. And the heavy primaries are suppressed by the exponential until you get to the uh, uh, part of the plot. So this double disk, so, so long story short, theories with gravity draws, with local gravity draws, are theory where this double disk is given by finite sum. That's exactly the uh, So it's going to be a really useful tool to, to, to transform the theory from that finite sum. And their interactions are uh, two derivative interactions or higher derivative as well? Uh, if, if they are higher derivatives, they would be uh, higher spin, we'll come back to that. But uh, uh, yes, they have to be at most two derivatives. So far, your construction is not telling us that information, right? No, but it will come out shortly. So, I see. So far, it's spectrum issue. Yeah. Okay. You see, see. you see our our spin treatment small with okay. all. So, so the idea is to make a, a to try to derive a dispersion relation, which will construct a full correlator mm -hmm. from its double discontinuity, and and you gotta try. So Armand and Kondu and and and, and Tajini, so in the so they probe the A index, they try to generalize it a bit, try to get the OP data for, for other, other operators, try to derive some dispersion relation by playing this exact same quantum argument as that. And what you find is if you put this uh, magnitude here and, and here, okay, I don't this, you find what I plot this M, but this M is, uh, is what I've shown before. This M is the uh, correlator minus its diffusion part. Try to do that, you find that an entity continuing in M gets something very nice for most of the plot, but in the middle you get some weird thing that some some analytic contribution that's completely unphysical. And you don't know what happens there. So in, in their dispersion relation, it always only worked in the region limit, where you look at large boosts so it's far out there. And then you this part that you don't know shrinks and you can ignore it. But in general, it doesn't work. You cannot reconstruct the full correlator from its, you know, it's you, you cannot put, reconstruct the full correlator from the imaginary part of that so If you it's attempt to do the bulk correlator or boundary correlator? The boundary form function. function. Right. So you try to extend this, this argument, try various things, it never works. So, so it was nice to hope that there was a dispersion relation, but in the end, I was not able to find it. So, so what I did in, instead last spring is I had to change the target. I try instead to have a dispersion relation not for the correlator but for the OP data. So I'll explain how, how that works. But morally, it's still going to be a dispersion relation. So, 
let's go back to flat space again, to this matrix. So the only data in the case of this matrix are basically part of waves. So you can uh, look at the amplitude, the scattering amplitude depends on angle, and you can do some Fourier decomposition. If you're more fancy, you would put a legend polynomial there. If you do Fourier decomposition and you plug the dispersion relation, you get an integral which gives you the plug one formula to the other, you get a formula for the partial waves in terms of the imaginary part of the amplitude. And a nice thing what you find is that this cosine somehow magically turns to the decaying exponential. And what you learn from this formula <laughs> is that the partial waves are actually an analytic incident. So the physical input about dispersion relation, which is causality, basically is equivalent to saying that the partial waves are analytic in So this, this uh, formula was essentially the, the uh, was it, Frosshoff group of formula? Uh, yes, the pictures, two names, I'm yeah. confused. And this, was, uh, this formula was a pillar of rigid theory. Who? Rigid theory. Oh, rigid. Yeah, this is rigid theory. <laughs> <laughs> So, so instead of thinking about NXT in energy, we can also think about NXT in spin, and they are, they are, they are called the same formation. This formula has a intuitive derivation. Again, it's a contour deformation trick. So if you want to integrate against a cosine, you can write it as a contour integral of the unit circle, some phase like that. And then for one of the and then the trick is just to close the contour of cuts. This cuts all the discontinuities of the amplitude. Yeah. The variables. And yeah, on one term you want to close on the outside. And the idea is that uh, if J is big enough, you can drop the contour, you can drop this arc to infinity. And similarly on the line there, you can drop the arc now zero. So the physics is that, yeah, provided that you can bound them to the rigid limit, this is an integral. Is rigid limit really as simple as taking j infinity? No, it's not j to infinity. It's uh, it's it's boost to infinity. So it's like uh, x of i theta to infinity. Yeah, and, and this derivation also makes it clear why uh, the Rotation angle becomes a boost angle in that formula. So x y theta becomes a function. So, so this, this formula is already the same. So, so with some group theory, one can generalize this formula. So here we just discuss the SO2 case where cosine becomes some exponential. What Frosshar and Grubov actually did was a, it was a SO3 case where they found a divergent polynomial to this trick became the actual logical function, that's the one which decayed exponential, so that that's the solution which looks like decay exponential. And essentially, with now that this is said, the idea is that we can now use the method of the missing box and look on the left, where the we have these countable blocks which account for the nuclear space account for the SO D plus one comma one sandwich week. Now we're gonna find the Lorentzian version of that. Just do with this and over two. So then we don't have to guess, so the group theory is going to lead us to, to the answer. And you will find that. Yes. Yes. That's the, yes. The, yeah, that, that's the result of the paper. <laughs> so okay, just to give some picture, what some idea what these blocks look like. Uh, so in 4D, for example, there's some product of hypergeometry. Uh, not even dimension, they're more complicated, but we can still evaluate them by, by series expansion. So, so because they come from the bootstrap community, have excellent tools to deal with these functions. Uh, some small technical subtlety I want to skip. So basically, the block set depends on two discrete labels, the spin and the dimension of the operator you're exchanging. Instead of summing over a dimension, you can actually turn things into a uh, integral of a dimension, which is basically kind of a mega integral. 
spend time on that, but it's, uh, that step is useful because if you want to make spin continuous, you kind of first have to make dimensions continuous. But that step was done before. So there. Um, and then there will be data and problem ends up being encoded. Okay, so you don't have any specific field theory. Uh, you it's just have yeah. you have this delta from two yeah. point function, and you have also uh, this f yeah. for the three point function. Yeah. Is that it? You're That's it. Yeah. And what about the large gap business? How does that come in? The large gap means that you only need this, these inputs for a finite number of fields. The one we're talking about is spin zero, one, two. So in general, you need there will be data for infinity many fields. Provide. If you go back to the formula where you had an F uh, below, yeah. right there, F yeah. O O. Yeah, yeah. So this F, uh, yeah, how so do you fit in your assumption of large gap? Yes, yeah, so the point is we're going to need only this Fs for a few J and delta. Few Js and delta. That's the yeah, assumption. Yeah, as opposed to a fifty yes. Okay. The tricky part with the following is that uh, in, in the cosine case, we have to split the cosine into two parts, one which is big outside the disk and one which is big inside the disk. And well, so the small inside and small outside. And, and the tricky part was to split the contour blocks in this way. So that, that, that's the calculation that I actually have to do. And it was a basic calculation because it turns out that there's not like two natural solutions. It's a function of two others and there's eight natural solutions. So when you try to do these splittings, there's eight solutions, there are two that are nice in one limit, two that are nice in the other limit. So we get four parameters, eight constraints. So so for that for like many months I just sat on this and said, well, it's not gonna work. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's the over constraint. It's over constraint, so I didn't do anything about this thing. But then uh, the, eventually I realized they really wanted this formula. <laughs> so I checked, because you never know, right? So it could be that the constraints are degenerate and there is a solution. And indeed, there is a unit. So it's not obvious, but there was a solution. And the result is the following. So you get a formula that gives you the OP coefficients in our channel. In terms of an integral or some Lorentzian region of this funny block, I mentioned this missing box. So now it's just a block with spin and dimension exchange. Times this absorptive part of the amplitude or the other config. Now, so what is special here is that to compute this right hand side, you just need a finite sum over the, the light operators. Yeah, but how finite is finite? I mean, yeah, how specific must you be to perform this summation? I mean, yeah, you so cannot example, just say I have few operators, right? You have to say exactly how many. Yeah. So for example, if you say that you only have the stressed answer, mm -hmm. then you only have one term here. Can you get away with that? Just the yeah. answer. Yeah, you can assume that the only light operator is the stressed answer, yes. And then in the other channel, you will get all the double trace operators. You come from three. So, the, so this formula is telling you that the double traces are fixed by the single traces. And, and, uh, and you a bit of more, more work, you can also see that you cannot stop there, you will need AV states like string states or something like that. So, so that's wrong to expect from there. But we'll come back to the problem in a second. And yeah, recently this uh, Simon Stuffin, Stanford, and, and Witten had, had a paper where they gave a uh, different derivation of the formula, which was more constructive, so they didn't need to solve any over constraint system, so it was clear from the start that we could get. Is it uh, correct that the idea of taking this double discontinuity is just to drop on the left hand side contribution from double trace yeah, yeah. On the right hand side? On the, on the right hand side this drops all the uh, so this this drops all the double traces from the T channel. So the idea is you, on the right hand side you use the T channel V to evaluate this and you drop all the double traces. But on the left hand side you get all the double traces for free. This formula is, is, is telling you how to construct double traces from single traces. The fact that you could do that was kind of a, a lesson of the Levin space approach. 
but you somehow also get the double traces for, for free. But this 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 also achieved that. Is this formula going to tell me how to uh, what the bulk interaction vertices are? But the bulk interaction vertices are fixed by these uh, three point functions of the TTT. Yeah, the Grafton set interactions are fixed by this. So that's something that, that's understood. So there's a few tensor, you know, these are indices, there's a few tensor contractions you can write down. And these map to different theories of gravity. Yeah, but what about this formula? I mean, this one, can I from it deduce what's the bulk vertex? On the left, I have the no, OP but, version. But the, right. bulk the bulk vertex is fixed at the inner level from the two-point function. Uh -huh. And that, that's fixed up to like two uh, three numbers. These numbers will be the parameters in your Lagrangian. And this is telling you that once you fix these two point interactions, you can reconstruct the full point and correlate it And it's telling you how to go from two point to four points. So, okay, you get this formula. First thing I did is I tried it in some example, like two deizing. There, I did this variable looks like that. The looks empty is positive as you expect. You just feed that into the integral. The integral is nicely factorized in given dimensions, so you get the product of the two, one three of two for the C and one three of two for the C bar. Then you set the OP data and code it in the pose of this function, you compute the pose, you get exactly the OP decomposition of the 3 d ring into the So so this formula works. <laughs> so so we're very, very happy with that. And then you can start to do some, some physics with it. So I'm not going to dwell on this story. It's, this, this was one, one application. Uh, a lot of the conformal, analytic conformal bootstrap normally is done at, in terms of a large spin expansion. So now there's some, it was understood is some corner of the amplitude which, which terminates at large spin. The story, all I want to say is that if you just take large spin into the formula, you naturally get some power like that, which pushes you to some corner. So this, this is going to push you to the d-bar and to one, if the exponent is large. So you naturally push to the uh, zero one corner, exactly as, as people have done before. And then in that limit, you can do the integral in terms of gamma functions. And basically, uh, basically all the previous results that from the large j expansion amount to uh, expanding the OP and then degrading uh, One thing which is nice just to give you one flavor of this, on the 3D Ising model, if you put in very few operators in the cross channel, like the, the stress tensor and the, uh, the, the lightest uh, even operator, you can get you get a curve like that for the uh, for the leading twist of that, the dry axis is the twist of the first the first family of operator as function of basically a spin. You get a nice curve like that. So that. That curve was predicted by uh, Alda and Chiboyev, and I remember correctly from by Simon Dutton. And what's kind of amazing, what was amazing with this curve is that it was derived by doing a one over J expansion, but it works up to like J over two. Which is shockingly well. And, but so what is new here is that this this inversion uh, integral really explain why it works down to j equal to two because we replace this in, this this inverse spin extension by just some convergent OP sum, and, and this sum we can probe it has to converge for j bigger than one, so so it explains why it works so well, but also it gives us control over the end of spin, so this kind of a senseless expansion, you know, if someone gives you a spectrum where this guy sits sticks out, you ask uh, is it a numerical problem or is that uh, maybe that's the True story. Here you can really rule it out. There cannot be anything sticking out. So things that really have to fall into uh, analytic trajectories. So spectrum really is analytic spin. And okay, we can find the bound error. That's the long, the long story. But I want to, want to discuss now. I'll come back to the bound totality. So okay, as I already mentioned. When you compute this double disk, the sine squared kills the double traces, and these exponents kill the uh, every operators. The theory with classical ideas well, the theory is where you just have a finite sum. And you have this, this plot. 
And uh, you have a finite sum for most of the kinematic region, except some corner which you can be sensitive to the eigenstates. states. And what happens when you plug in the, uh, the uh, inversion formula is you can split the result into a contribution from above the gap and the contribution below the gap. Basically what's going to happen is the contribution above the gap will give you some, will give you all of the uh, exchange of the light fields, will give you, sort of, will give you all, of the, uh, all of these written diagrams where you exchange things. And the contribution from below the gap gives you local interactions. And, and, and because there's only so much area there, you can, you can plot this. Do you get anything other than local interactions? No, it's really, within that regime, it's really the twofold. Yeah. There, are, there are local interactions for me here means that higher derivative terms you will have to relax. But here you are looking at the complete correlator, right? So it should have, on the both sides, should have some exchanges. Yes. These exchanges come from that light. Uh, so can you see that they match? Uh, like what you see in the correlator matches what you're supposed to have in the bulk? Yeah, that, yeah that, that's understood from uh, like in, uh, the relation between individual uh, with a diagram and come from blocks is, is, is something that that is understood that I'm taking for granted here. Yeah. You, you are not checking holography in any way, right? You're building what CFT tells you about the bulk interactions. So you're not, there's no... Uh, but there, there, there's, but there, there's one part of the CFT which is really dynamical and deep, and there's one part which is just kinematical, that the symmetries match. And that kinematical part that the symmetries match tells you that somehow uh, 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 the uh, double discontinuity of this Witten diagram is equal to a single component block. But until it's now, not a trivial result, but it's a known result that I'm taking as an input. Excuse me. Until now, in your talk, you've only told us about CFT, what to do with it. Yeah, it's just CFT, so exactly. There so was the, no mention of any bulk theory. No, no, so, the, so exactly. So the fact that this, this component block, for lack of error, can be interpreted as this continuum of a Witten diagram, mm -hmm. is something that's basically kinematic, mm -hmm. that, that was understood. So that's not something new. But, but, but it, it, it is important for the interpretation. It looks to me like you're driving a bulk theory, a graph, some graph theory. You are not, you are not trying to prove a holographic reality between a given uh, graph theory and a, and a CFT. But yeah, let me come yeah, to what, okay. what is proved. Okay. okay. So, so the main point is that when you plug in this inversion integral, you, you learn that you have to weight the uh, this origin by this power of uh, rho of r, the g over 2, that's just from, from the blocks. So basically, this region that you don't control gets suppressed at large spin. So because there's only so much area you can squeeze in that region, if you have to weight that area by this power, you get con a contribution that decays like the other gaps to the powers of the spin. So, so if you look at the OP data, the contribution from the AD operators is bounded and in the case like spin like that. So what this is for it tells you, so the, the spin is, is exactly, if you, if you look at the, the solution of crossing symmetry by Wolczynski and friends uh, uh, seven years ago, they understood that the spin was essentially the number of derivatives of your integrand uh, of your vertex. So, so this is a diagram that go like s to the j. And this formula tells you that the coefficient of a term which go like s to the j is suppressed by this gap to the power of the vertex. So th this is the formula which justifies body effects if you do. So it does tell you that terms with more derivatives need to have small so that, that, that is what it's shown. The fact that the terms that are not suppressed look like what you would get from, from gravity calculation is, is, is a different story. That, but that, that story is already uh, yesterday. 
Yeah, some technical comment. Actually, it's not exactly, spin does not count exactly number of dimensions or the number of derivatives, but it's totally related. Uh, yeah. So physically what this gives is dispersion relation for the OP data. But actually once we have that, we can resum the OP and actually get the dispersion relation for the correlator. So the thing we started with trying to find, actually now we have. So this will be uh, published in some work that, 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 that's through here. And with hand psych, this, this function k is a function of four variables. And it turns out to be some elliptic function, so we we'll never uh, guessed it. <laughs> so, so we can get kind of with the focus of the OP data. But, but now we have, I think it's a nice formula. So, so basically in like five minutes I want to sketch you how we apply this like concretely in some specific period for gravity. So, so how do you reconstruct the ADS5 plus S5 for gravity? Okay. So, so tree level, as I said, is very simple. You just have to uh, account for so the subset part because of this continuity comes only from light single traces. In this theory, at strong coupling, they only come from half DPS operator. So in the CFT, that's what we do. You like two of them, um, and they turn out to give you a very simple uh, uh, discontinuity. This comes from the specific blocks. Uh, and then you just plug that into the inversion integral, and you get a uh, disconnected part of the data, that's the number of dimension, and that's the uh, one correction scale of the data. So you get all that just by, by integrating this against. But I'm getting imaginary parts of this diagram on the left, right? The, yeah. the full tree diagram I cannot get in this way. Is that right? No. You see, the input is the imaginary part. The output is the full OP data, which sums the full diagram. The second dispersion relation, we reconstruct the full thing from the cut. If you don't reconstruct just one diagram, you reconstruct the sum of all diagrams from the cut. And the result match exactly what people have computed through the gravity diagram. So we did the, so really, just to answer your question, we did the calculation that's 100% the CFT sign, but then it matches exactly what people have obtained in, in, by doing a written diagram computation in SuperGraph. And I think our calculation was much simpler. Than that. But if you didn't have SuperGraph in the bulk from your CFT computations, you could not have predicted exactly what the bulk theory should be, right? You, you well, we would, have, we would have been able to predict what the four-point correlator is. Then to realize that this four-point correlator comes from within diagram, it, it's, it's a different story. Yeah. So to go and find that theory which gives that diagram is another yeah. story, you're saying? Yeah. You just but, know the answer. Yeah, yeah, but, 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 that's, the that, but, but that story is, is the easy mm -hmm. part, really, because mm -hmm. once you have the three-point function, so I fix up to a number, that, that fixes the three-point interaction in the bug, up to recursion of motions, and that's enough to write down the Lagrangian. And yes. The Lagrangian is off shell. Your three points yeah, are yeah, off shell. The, the difference between off shell and on shell gives you extra contact terms, which, so here, again, we, so, so we construct a full four point correlator up to possible contact interactions. Four point contact interactions. And if you have other principles, if you don't have SUSY, these are new parameters. If you have SUSY, you can put most of them to zero. So that, that's the logic. So you construct your Lagrangian order by order in the field like that. So you start with the three-point function that give you a Lagrangian that's defined up to four-point contact interactions, and then and so on. So yeah, I think I think that, that that's the easy part. We're constructing the, the, the constructing with gravity theory you're looking at is the easy part. And the new thing is that yeah, now we get control over the possible contact term. And yeah, if you have supersymmetry as in this theory, the uh, the, the the first ambiguity is an R4 counter term, which is proportionally can count. So, so then once you understand tree level, you can apply this at one loop. Right? Because so the first thing you the thing you need at one loop is that uh, the double discontinuity around the graph, it really works like unitarity, like the like Koski rule, you have to solve all the uh, things here. 
Strictly speaking, what this thing means in the CFT here is mixing between different double trace operators. But you know, it really works like a complicated rules. So we have to compute this product of trees, which is known. So we did that last summer by some groups. And just by feeding that into the inversion integral, we get the formula. We're going to describe it. But I think what is nice is what we studied, especially the bulk point limit. The limit where you try to localize into the bulk. You try to, to throw in some weight packet that, that's scattering in the bulk. That limit is basically taking the uh, operator, double trace operators with large dimension. So you need a high center of mass energy in case you get to localize. And in this limit, you're supposed to match basically to the uh, partial wave extension of the mass space energy. So the five dimension of space. And in this CFT, if you try to localize like that in the bulk, you try to have scattering at distances smaller than the EDS radius, you never have a local 5 peak theory. It is not in this EDS 5, it's in this EDS 5 plus 5 setup. You really just have 10 dimensions of like 2D sort of gravity. So, so the theory against which we had to compare our result was that theory in 10 dimension. So the one of episode was years ago by Zimburn and others. Actually, that, 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 that formula is from uh, uh, Green and Schwartz in the 80s. It's string theory. But uh, so three levels is some three level graph. And at one loop, you get a sum of three box integrals. You have to integrate them in 10 Ds. You get the result. Then we decompose it over, over five D partial waves, which is what's supposed to match the four the blocks. You get some results. Uh, and we found a perfect match between one loop type 2B and, and the, uh, the CFT calculation. The, what, what's interesting, what I want to do this is the mechanism. So I'm not going to show you the results, but I'm just telling you why it worked. The mechanism is interesting. It becomes obvious if we recall the flat space crossover Weber formula which also gives you the partial wave coefficient in terms of discontinuity of the magnitude uh, against some, that's some hard line, that's some x for the factor. And what you find basically is that the, the match works even before we look at the correlator. It works already at the level of the, so the double discontinuity of the correlator, when we take this flat space limit, directly becomes a discontinuity of the amplitude. So the absorptive part on both sides matches. And this analogy, which I motivated at the beginning of the talk, this double disk with the imaginary part, it literally works. <laughs> if people really compute bundle corrections to, into ADS5, process 5, uh, no, no, but this is a flat space limit. Oh. So, so if you try to look, if you, if you scatter things, if you look at the, if you take a mm. kinematic limit, where uh, the graph, the whole loop, takes place close to a point. If you localize to distances smaller than the ADS radius, it's just a flat space computation. That was done by Green and Schwartz in 83. And we, that what we match is the result of this calculation from, from that limit. So basically, the, the agreement can be summarized by this primitive diagram. So on the CFT side, we start from this double discontinuity and reconstruct the whole corridor from it. And when we take this flat space limit, this kinematic limit where the uh, cross ratio is something like z equal to z bar, take this flat space limit, we match exactly the imaginary part as computed from the Kotkowski rules and from the dispersion relation when we construct it from the end. And the inversion integral really becomes the dispersion relation. So what we have is the CFT version of the bulk dispersion equation. Uh, brief stick, brief, so that's my last slide. So one thing I should add, so these box integrals in 10 dimension, they are really divergent. So supergravity is only, you know, it's not normalizable. You get a quadratic divergence. On the CFT side, we also have a quadratic divergence. It only affects spin zero, because for higher spin, the, uh, this, this little sliver will kind of control the stress. 
Newtonian effect is zero, and we can match it to the R4 quantum term. So we get the divergent proportional to R4 operator. And one thing which is new, which was not, I don't think it was known before, is that you know, in field theory, people will often do things like, like dimensional regularization, where you throw away power divergences. But from our results, we can see that because uh, the quotient of, of R4 counter term is equal to minimal subtraction plus a positive definite integral, which looks like it diverged up to this uh, gap. So we can prove that the quotient of this R4 has to be at least as big as the gap. The gap squared. So, so in flat space unit, that means that the quotient is at least as big as the uh, alpha prime. So if one of alpha prime. And, and indeed, the, the important type to be string theory, it's, it's alpha prime to the uh, three alpha. So one of alpha prime to three alpha. So, so, so it's consistent with type to be string effective mm -hmm. action. But, but this, is a, this is really a direct proof that if you try to do minimal subtraction, you will end up in a swamp then. This R4 counter term has to be at least as big as the, your gap. Uh, yeah. so that, that, that's at least one non perturbative thing we can say about, about the experience of gravity. So, yeah, so in summary, we take the dispersion relation for all the coefficients. We get the data from integrating. Sorted part. The input was basically that we're looking at the CFT that's unitary. You can apply this in any theory to stuff and things with the ADS CFT. But when you apply it to theories with the ADS CFT duo, you find that the right hand side is computable by essentially the finite sum. You can bound, you know, get various bounds in either of the directions, but I'm going to calculate above. And this move maybe takes. Um, like to do as a follow up, I would like to understand better how is it that this summing of all these kicking words really matches the local theory. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so you mentioned uh, about the unitarity in ADS computation in ADS yeah. and also capacity group. Can it be done like rigorously and one trace that if you compute this Wigan diagram with a loop, then at the region where it goes on shell, uh, then you get from there imaginary part or something like that? Yeah. I, I would think it can be done, but I have not have not done it. So so the thing which I can tell you is that what, what people understand about this Wigan diagram is that the known results that if you if you draw with an diagram like that, and you do the OPE, it's known that it, it, it's basically sum over. Uh, uh, so this this graph is basically uh, one block plus an infinite sum over the whole traces. Okay. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Blind spot. But the. This this the convention is known. So with a diagram, if you if you take this diagram and you expand it to that channel, it's equal to one block, which is a block you would expand from the top. This is the number of that's not that you're exchanging. Okay. Plus an infinite sum with other traces. Basically come from cutting this graph like that. And but if you take the double disk of this graph, then the double disk kills the double trace part, and you just get the use of the other So it was so I'm using this as an input. It would be nice to understand this more directly. But the double disk of with a diagram is a double disk of a single block. Yeah. This this would really like conceptually answer the, the question how do you see ABS emerge? Right now I'm just using this as a this known fact is known. It would be nice to understand better how that works. Okay, but if it goes like, if we talk about loops, then yeah. in flat space. If you have loops, you have to read something special going on with them because you have uh, branch cuts, which you don't have to give out. Yeah. And do you see something like special uh, in the ADS? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's very similar. The, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yes, I don't know, but from the CFT four point function, the analytic structure of the correlator, if, so if I just replace this by uh, this plane, by physically uh, uh, this, this row variable that I can do explain, yeah. you get the same picture. <laughs> So at so three level you get poles, and at one loop this becomes a cut, and this double discontinuity is basically thinking of 
benchmark image. So, so the core, you don't really have to go to like momentum space or things like that. Really just the correlator in coordinate space as an analytic structure that's very similar. But that thing is not really like many numbers. It's not a many numbers at all. It's just function. the correlator is a function of the z and z bar, or the orthogonal bar. It's just, it's just a function of coordinates. So the coordinate space correlator has a very similar analytic structure to the momentum space and You don't have to do any median or anything, just, just in coordinate space only. All right, in the interest of time, why don't we uh, thank our speaker again and then continue afterwards.